Welcome to Transformation with Martinet. Martinet Emmons is a transformational life coach who broke free from childhood abuse, sexual trauma, and overcame cancer to become a powerful force of healing and hope for others. Martinet describes traumatic events as fierce emotional tsunamis. They can leave impending doom and destructive tidal waves of emotions that hit you when you least expect it. Martinet helps her clients dive into the depths of their trauma and pain as she stands fiercely advocating for them to shine a light on those experiences and find the lesson in the pain. She serves as a beacon of hope that guides you to see the strength, lessons, and purpose that can be born from the pain. You can feel alive with purpose again when you awaken your dormant strength, step into your power with a sense of peace, and discover a new wave of hope with the right tools and support. Martine and her guests are here shining their lights today through empowering stories of hardship and transformation to inspire you to find hope and to see that there is a beautiful blue ocean of serenity, happiness, and fulfillment in your future. Transformation with Martine starts now. Welcome everyone to Transformation with Martine. This is where we overcome everything and compromise nothing. For those of you who don't know, my show is every Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. And I'm on the East Coast, so I always say 1 p.m. first Eastern. And mm -hmm. also for those of you that don't know, um, my show is about hope. My guests that I invite on and myself, we are warriors. We've been through a lot in this life. And we together collectively believe that no matter what you've been through, you can get back up from anything. We are proof. So without further ado, I want to in introduce my guest. He goes by Mr. J. He is a wonderful relationship coach. And um, please introduce yourself a little bit better than I, I did. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I say all the time, listen, first of all, I'm a dad, so I have a lot of corny dad jokes, so I'm going to have to ah, ask you right. to excuse me in advance, but I always say, you can call me Coach J, Mr. J, any J, just don't call me late for dinner, um, but I am what's called an intrapersonal relationship coach and a betrayal trauma practitioner, mm -hmm. and so what an intrapersonal relationship coach is, is um, all relationships start with ourselves. Um, the relationship we have with ourselves sets the tone and standard for all other relationships around us. So I like to work on the relationship that people have with themselves. Mm -hmm. That's not one. That's what I've been doing for a while. Um, and then uh, by actually happenstance, believe it or not, I was um, Googling uh, some stuff a couple of years ago and I found this uh, wonderful, wonderful TED talk. And long story short, I got involved with this um, organization and um, f fell in love with uh, betrayal trauma and trauma mm -hmm. itself and what it mm -hmm. does. Because let's face it, I don't care who you are, what you are. We all uh, have experienced betrayal. We've all experienced trauma. We've all experienced betrayal trauma to some degree or another. Mm -hmm. So I was fascinated with the topic. And, um, and so I uh, got certified to become a, a betrayal trauma practitioner. And so now I do both of those things. So I'll get calls from people that, you know, they're about to give a speech and they just need, you know, some quick uh, uh, yeah. pick me ups and, and, and an ego boost or what have you. And then mm -hmm. I'll get other people that, you know, are all under the spectrum of finding out, you know, they've been betrayed. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, there's people that are on the phone while they're bear hugging the toilet vomiting because they just found out. And then there's people yeah. I talk to that are 30 years out of betrayal and for just some mm -hmm. reason they're stuck. So, um, so that's what I've been doing. I love it. Um, and, uh, and, and I, 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 I won't say I'm good at it, but I'm here and I've stayed. And, uh, and so I think, I think I do help people. So actually I help people help themselves. Yeah. Well, you're relatable though. See, I yeah. mean, to me, it, it, that's what it's all about is, you know, for our clients is, is telling our story. They don't really care so much where we are now. They want to know that they can get to where you are now. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. I found that relatability is far more desired, even over likability. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. I know that's what's drawn me to the coaches that I'm in, the community that I'm in is people that I can just be like, oh man, okay. They, they, they didn't just get lucky. They had to go through a lot 
to get where they are. Today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're talking to somebody who understands firsthand your experience, mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. conversations at a completely different energy level. Yeah. The most hundred percent, hundred percent. So would you mind sharing your, I, I will be really honest. And I know that you want to focus on the now and the good yeah. and all that, but your story was heartbreaking to me. Um, <laughs> heartbreaking it is and and you know I my, my story isn't pretty either but yours is particularly heartbreaking especially being so young would you mind going into that and telling yeah, us no what you've been through and okay yeah no problem you know I think um first and foremost you know there's always a setup phase so there's a mm -hmm. setup phase when you're younger whether it's your um attachment style or let's mm -hmm. just say there's even a setup phase with a spousal betrayal there's always something that mm -hmm. you know there's a setup stage mm -hmm. and i think um uh, absolutely nothing at all against my parents in any capacity because nobody mm -hmm. brings children into the world to um you know to to not raise them in the most loving way possible but i think mm -hmm. because of the the situation that my parents did bring children into the world they weren't really mm -hmm. on the same page a lot a lot of arguing mm -hmm. and things. So already there was the setup stage where my attachment issue was not um, confident. It was not secure. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Gotcha. And then number two, uh, so when we were about six, I was about six and a half um, and uh, we owned a home and we left for the weekend. And when we came back, um, unbeknown to us, the house caught on fire over the weekend. So when we pulled into the driveway, there was really nothing left, in, left standing but the chimney. And the reason I say that was significant, um, because first of all, nobody, no child that age wants to see their parent crying and devastated. And that's what my parents were doing. Mm -hmm. They lost everything, mm -hmm. family heirlooms, mm -hmm. our, their kids' first haircuts. We lost all of our toys. I mean, you know, the, mm -hmm. we, there was nothing left but the chimney. Um, and you also, as a six and a half year old, you, you can't, you feel hopeless and helpless and you can't help. And a, mm -hmm. and a child, unlike an adult, as we all know, they start to personalize. So, yes, you know, yes. was there something I could have done? Should I, you know, A, B, and C, which obviously when you're an adult, you know, you're thinking, well, that's ridiculous to have that thought. You're not thinking that's ridiculous at six and a half. What can mm -hmm. I do to make, you know, my parents feel better? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyways, um, moving on, we, um, uh, I went and uh, we stayed with an uncle of mine for a little while. Mm -hmm. And because um, we had no place to go, we didn't own the house. So there's no insurance. Um, I think mm -hmm. we were renting to own. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, m my father, he was a hardworking man, but he did not have any lucrative career by any means. So, um, we kind of, uh, hopped around from, you know, getting things from the Salvation Army or family handouts, whoever could mm -hmm. help us out. Um, and when, uh, one time when I was at my uncle's house, actually a couple, multiple times when I was at my uncle's house, um, one of the things that he would, um, do to uh, allow me to show him uh, our, my appreciation was to take mm -hmm. me in, into his bedroom at night and uh, and thank him. And I always say, I don't know what's worse, Martin A, the actual abuse or the silent internal screaming the next morning at the breakfast table when you know, you know what happened last night, but everybody's mm -hmm. eating and saying, pass me the milk and the Cheerios. Yeah. Um, so moving on, um, we, uh, you know, we, we wound up uh, getting an apartment in the city and, um, and again, uh, you know, I, I, nothing at all against my mother in any capacity or my father, but I think my mother kind of started to sow her wild oats and feel that, geez, I missed out on a lot. And so she kind of got into more of like the partying mode where she wanted mm -hmm. to kind of, um, you know, party. She never did. She was born and raised on a farm. Um, a big part of me can't blame her. But along with those parties came, you know, a lot of uh, middle of the night um, taps on my bedroom door uh, where I was open and susceptible to whoever wanted to come in and, you know, do whatever they, they chose and pleased. Um, so in all of this, uh, I had a, um, a list when I was younger. And so I was kind of thrown mm -hmm. into special ed for a little while. And I always tell people special ed today is far different from the special ed of years ago. I mean, years ago, you were thrown into special ed with everyone who had anything, mm -hmm. usually with one teacher, um, uh, way, way at the other side of the school, um, you know, past all the classrooms, past the library, past the office. I mean, you know, you felt like a freak. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it, and with, with everybody in that room, no matter what their uh, challenge was, physical, emotional, mental, what have you. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, on that time that um, 
that uh, I really started to 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 just you know fear a lot, question a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And I was also very close with my younger sister, who I tried to help take care of, you know, during a lot of this mess. Yes. Um, and uh, I don't know where you want me to stop in my uh, very early teen years, um, wind up moving out, um, mm -hmm. which left me homeless for a little while. And, um, yeah. and then it wasn't until uh, I got robbed at gunpoint twice where I decided I, I got to make some differences. Um, in my life. I can fill all kinds of gaps in, but I, do, I don't want to sit here and talk for an hour and a half. Um. Right. Got you. Um, yeah. It, uh, we have, we have stuff in common. Um, and I, I, especially like you're talking about just how is it the next day when you're thinking about these things and nobody's really thinking about it. It's like, they seem to be past it or not even knowing what's going on. You know, that is a rough thing. Very rough thing. So I didn't leave home as soon as you did, but I was 17. So there's, there's definitely like try, take care of yourself and adapting to a world on your own and trying to figure things out. And I remember my dad dropping me off. Um, it was like in the middle of the night, pouring rain and the mattress that I had going into this apartment was soaking wet by the time I got there. And I remember just getting in there. What do I do? And um, trying to find the lights, getting in there because he just basically dropped me off. And um, I just remember crying all night long. I'm like, what am I going to do? Everything I have is wet. Everything is, what am I going to do? But then it's like, you know, we are warriors. We're survivors. We find a way. So we are going to take a break. But when we come back, I would love to know if, like for me, for example, I always seem to see this light somewhere. Even if I was like, felt like I was in a cave and just gloom was around me or fear was around me, I always seem to see this light. And maybe it was the same for you. I'd love to talk about that a little bit when we get back. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so much, everyone. And we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to Transformation with Martinet, where we overcome everything and compromise nothing. My guest today is Mr. Jay, and he has been sharing his story. And before we left on break, um, we mentioned that sometimes it is hard being in the midst of a traumatic situation and everybody in your household kind of acting like everything's normal and it really isn't, is a hard thing. And I had said that I always saw a light. There was always something sent, telling me that it'd be okay. And um, Jay, did you have that same thing? Like maybe that there was something that told you it'd be all right? Yeah, uh, to be honest with you, I, I, I had, no, I did not, I did not at all. Mm -hmm. Now I was raised, believe it or not, and I know there's a lot of contradiction and juxtaposition with all this other stuff, but mm -hmm. I was raised in a very, very spiritual home. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the outer tones were extremely spiritual. The, the practicing mm -hmm. was a different story, but the outer mm -hmm. tones were extremely spiritual. So in those times where um, where I was deeply at my worst or saddened, I, I probably knew that I was being watched by, you know, a higher power, mm -hmm. um, which gave me, you know, certainly um, uh, probably some comfort at times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly when you're younger, you, you'd like something a little bit more tangible, a little bit more material. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but I'm going to be honest with you that it, that's actually strengthened my my spiritual relationship tremendously mm -hmm. um, because because I think, you know, and, and not to get all spiritual, but I think sometimes if we are going to trust, if you if you believe in a higher power, if you believe in mm -hmm. God, if you are mm -hmm. going to trust, um, you, you that has to that has to again be um, there's no substitute for experience. So mm -hmm. you just can't trust God because my parents trusted God. You know, mm -hmm. it reminds me one time where uh, my daughter this summer, uh, who was four years old, uh -huh. and she had on her um, swimmy. We're outside in our pool, yeah. and uh, I said, "Here, jump to Papa." And she said, no, because I'll go under the water. And I said, I know you will. You're going to go underwater, but then Papa's going to make sure that I bring you up and you're okay. Because I wanted mm -hmm. her to know that there might be a dip, but she's going to be, right. she's going to be risen back up. And that's what I think spirituality taught me is that no matter how deep I get, no matter how low mm -hmm. I go or dip, I'm going to be um, lifted back up. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I, I felt the same way um, that it would just be okay somehow 
didn't know exactly yeah. how. And it doesn't feel I good knew. in the moment. No. It doesn't feel good in the moment mm-hmm. because, you know, conceptually we're thinking, you know, we're using our brain. How am I going to get out of this? How am I going to pay next month's rent? What am I going to mm-hmm. eat tomorrow? Mm-hmm. How am I going to save myself from that? You know, yeah. we, you know, we don't, of course, we're thinking with our own currency, not on the currency of spirituality or what mm-hmm. have you. So, yeah. Um, so uh, faith plays a large role um, in my life and always has. Um, mm-hmm. And primarily because it's been tested <laughs> all of my life. Right. Right. And that's how we learn. The lessons is how we learn, you know, and that's it. Yeah. And that's something that um, one of my master coach, who I got my master certification with and coaching certification and who I've done a lot of my work with. Um, he says, you cannot um, be grateful for the lessons and hate the teacher. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Or, or you cannot be you cannot truly love yourself and hate mm-hmm. the experiences that shape you, you know? Right. Um, yeah. Um, you know, certainly. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Sorry for interrupting you. Oh, no, 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 no. That, that, that's exactly, um, it, it, either way you look at it, it sums up the basically the same thing. You know, if we can be grateful for all that we have been through, it carries us into purpose, you yeah. know, because like, yeah. you know, I know I wouldn't, I'm sure you would not be doing what you're doing today. If you just no, had absolutely. this easy childhood absolutely. or perfect time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, so sometimes you can find yourself saying, well, geez, I just wish I didn't have to go through that. And that's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. Hey, in a perfect world, none of us would have went through anything we're doing. But right. the fact is we did. So now what mm-hmm. are we choosing to do with it? You know, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Um, a lot of life's hardships, I look at it as, uh, you know, when you go to the gym, well, I'm, I guess there are some people that love lifting weights, but like <laughs> nobody sits there and loves to struggle. I mean, it hurts. Right. You're mm-hmm. lifting these weights. You're like, but, yeah. but it's doing you good. You're getting yep. a workout, but it's doing you good. Well, mm-hmm. sometimes when we go through this misery and betrayal and trauma and all this hurt in life, it's, it's, it's doesn't feel good at all, but it's giving mm-hmm. us a life workout. We're going to reap the benefits of it. Um, Absolutely. Providing, we, Absolutely. providing we, we do something good with it because we could also become jaded, stuck, miserable, mm-hmm. you know, like the mm-hmm. Grinch at Christmas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we can always reframe things. Like you're talking about the gym. You know, one of my mentors is Lisa Nichols. I work with her on her team as well. And she says that, um, well, what she does in, instead of saying she's getting a workout in, she's getting her sexy back. And oh, I yeah. like that. It's like, we can reframe anything the Absolutely. way, you know, to make it feel good to us. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Right? And by yeah. the way, reframing is a big uh, chunk of how I help people because mm-hmm. our thoughts are so ridiculously powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, so anyways, but that's neither here nor there. No, that, yeah, that's a very good point. So I I just want to mention something just fun before we go into the next bit here though. But um, because Sex and the City just came out with a new um, (laughs) era or whatever, um, I'd love to hear about your time on there just because it seems so fun right now. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I was on a couple episodes of uh, Mm -hmm. Sex and the City. 99.9% of it, I'm sure, was all on the, you know, cut on the floor of post-production. But uh, I met all the girls, um, Mm -hmm. all one, um, uh, especially Samantha is the sexy one or supposed to be like the sexy one. um, 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 Samantha? I'm sorry, who's the tall? She was on Mannequin back in the 80s. It, the one who played Samantha, right? Um, God, what is her name? She's not on this new one. Oh, she's not. Remember. No, okay. I can't remember her name. Oh, she. Anyway, yeah. no, they were all wonderful, all nice. Mm-hmm. In between takes, they would be throwing grapes at you know some people to <laughs> catch or you know talking. Yeah. Um, there was one that kind of retreated back to her trailer in between scenes, and she really wasn't that interested in, in meeting. Um, all of us commoners, but um, I won't mention her name because maybe she was having a bad day and I don't want to put anything, you know, bad taste. Yeah, in yeah. Uh, yeah, I had, a, I had, a, I was on Sex and the City um, probably about four times, Criminal Intent, a couple of movies. That's why I actually left oh, upstate fun. New York to, to pursue film and television mm-hmm. um, close to New York City. So um, it was a, it was a wonderful life. Uh, not to quote a movie, um, but it was a lifetime ago. Now I got kids and, yeah. and family and I'm yeah. coaching. <laughs> totally different thing but it's just kind of fun just be especially since this just came out and I'm oh like, yeah yeah is there any episodes we could catch you though you know what I think uh there's a sailor episode fleet week I think it was uh if you okay. literally pause the VCR at at you I mean you I'm a I'm a fluffy white thing dancing way in the background that's about <laughs> okay. as much as close as I got so no to answer your question 
Um, okay. no, all I know is I got paid well and I enjoyed my time on the set. Yeah, I bet. Oh, it's fun. Totally fun. It was a lot of fun. I of bet. Fun. I bet. that. Uh, yeah, it's just a show that my sister got me into. I didn't, I don't think I'd love it at first. The first few seasons, I didn't love it so much. And after that, and especially Big and Carrie, oh Lord, has sold. He's such a fine looking man. That it just, oh, really? Yeah, I, uh, no, so, so I don't is. follow, unfortunately, follow Sex in the City as mm-hmm. much, but um, it's very, do you remember like Luke and Laura? Maybe I'm dating myself back in the- um, um, That was General, General Hospital, Hospital days, right? Was it? Okay. Uh-huh. Um, is that what kind of like Carrie and Big is? Or like they're, they're the couple? Sort of, of yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I think I they- I Luke mean, and Laura were getting married. Like that was all over the TV. Like, you know, yeah. tune in next Friday, Luke and Laura are, you know, getting married. Yeah, I don't think Luke was as, I don't know, Big did a lot of things that were definitely not so good. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, but- I don't know. I, I remember that much more than I do the whole um, general hospital part. But I do remember thinking, oh, that was cool. I do remember watching it. Yeah. So anyway, fun stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go down memory lane. So, mm-hmm. you know, you were talking about I my the people I've always worked with have um, pretty much my ideal client is someone who has overcome trauma and they're on the other side. So trauma has always been my person as well. Um, but how would you describe betrayal trauma? Yeah, see, so this is what's interesting. So, um, so betrayal trauma has, um, everything, all the same language characteristics, struggles Mm -hmm. as trauma, only there's more of a, um, intentionality to it. There's Mm -hmm. more of a personal feel to it, but now this Mm -hmm. is what's interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to contradict what I just said. Okay. Even though there's a, even though there's a personal feel to it, even though there's an intentional feel to it, mm-hmm. betrayal trauma, nine times out of 10 is not intentional. It's not personal. You know, mm-hmm. when a, I'll just use a typical male, female, heterosexual, uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh example. Um, when, uh, a husband is found to have a sex addiction and his wife discovers that he was with 20 prostitutes in the past two years, mm-hmm. He didn't, he didn't call that prostitute and say, I'm going to intentionally hurt my wife. I mean, he had an addiction. Of course, we can mm-hmm. go back and forth if people think, um, you know, sex addiction exists. Mm-hmm. But so that's what I say is that, you know, even though there's an intentional feel to it um, or a personal feel to it, the behavior wasn't intentional. Um, mm-hmm. You know, no, no, just like parenting, nobody says, oh, I'm going to have a kid so I can bring them into the world so I can abuse them and, and, right. and, For and sure. screw up their For life, sure. you know? Um, uh, so yeah, so, so, which is, goes back to what I was saying before is so many things that we think about, we have to reframe our thought because, mm-hmm. um, that's what we're thinking. How could you do that to me? Well, mm-hmm. hold on a minute. He, 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 he didn't do that to you. He did it to himself. You just happen right. to be a, a default product. That's getting the, you know, the, yeah, the, um, that, the suffering that's the way it. to look at or it. how could he do that when I thought he loved me? Well, he did love you. He just didn't love himself. Or mm-hmm. let me compare myself to the person that you are with. Well, why? You're going to compare yourself to a chemical because nine times out of 10, it was adrenaline that got him to do what he did. So are you going to compare yourself mm-hmm. to a chemical? So, you know, there's a lot of these things that we talk about and we, you know, personalize, but it's, mm-hmm. but it's nothing to do at all with the intentionality, but betrayal trauma absolutely has intentionality behind it mm-hmm. or the feel of it. Yeah. You know, that, that's so much, <laughs> there's so much there, like with the, uh, to separate ourselves out of it even though it's hurt, say if I was the wife or whatever, I would definitely be hurt by it, but I knew it really has nothing to do with me, at least the growth that I've had. But a lot of people won't feel that way because they're insecure because they don't think that they're enough. And that's, that's the, that's the part to really figure out there. It's like, well, you got to get yourself right. Yeah. And yeah. now take into consideration all the other things too. Were you financially relying on this person? Um, mm-hmm. Was this, especially if you came from like a, um, an, a, a, an attachment style when you were younger mm-hmm. that wasn't secure? Um, mm-hmm. Did you did you put this person on say a hero status? Um, mm-hmm. And they and and now this knight in shining armor status that they once had that that saves you from all of the trauma and drama in your childhood. Mm-hmm. Now they're the very ones that hurt you the most. So, yeah. so your, your life is just complete and chaos. I tell people all the time that, you know, our life is like a very neatly uh, jam packed filing, filing, drawer, you know, filing cabinet. And mm-hmm. when betrayal comes in, it's like somebody takes that drawer, walks up a mountain and turns it upside down. You got files and papers that are strewn all over for miles and miles 
You don't know who you are, what you are, where you are. And if you do start to piece your life back together, what files are now going to suit this new 2.0 self? I mean, it just completely destroys, devastates, and damages every fiber of you. Uh, uh, from mm -hmm. a psychological perspective, a spiritual perspective. I, I mean, think of how many people say, God, I prayed for this person. I thought you brought mm -hmm. this person in my life. So now, did God, did you betray me? I mean, you question every fiber of your being. Take away all this, you know, the dopamine and the cortisols and the oxytocins mm -hmm. and all that that are completely jumbled now like a, uh, a ball of rubber band. Right. That's a really, really good way to look at it. Files just being thrown around the mountain. You have so many things to sort through. Yeah, because then you're like, wait a minute, I have that again. file here. What were you doing when that file was mm -hmm. here? Was it even real? What? I mean, the first, the first few weeks of betrayal trauma are, mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't, I don't judge anybody who, well, I don't, I don't judge anybody regardless, but I don't judge anybody's actions. And mm -hmm. I've heard and seen some pretty uh, people lighting cars on fire, running over their spouses. I get, mm -hmm. I understand mm -hmm. it. I mean, this, mm -hmm. this, this this completely destroys the core of who you thought you were. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Well, how do you start? How, when you find this out, how, what's like, what, what would be the, one of the first steps that you would tell somebody? Yeah. Well, well, it all depends because, um, you know, they might say, listen, I, I, I can't get any sleep. I, I have extreme insomnia. Mm -hmm. um, or some people say, I, I, for the first time ever, I'm experiencing panic attacks. I never even knew what a panic attack felt like until mm -hmm. this happened. Or, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and then it all depends because like, are, are, are you, are you, are you going to work on your relationship? Are you going, thinking of leaving your relationship? But at mm -hmm. the same token, I tell people don't make any big decisions the first few weeks. Um, right. so, so like th it, uh, this is this, you know, tightly wound ball of chaos. Um, uh, you know, do you, uh, do you have young kids? I mean, there's, there's a million mm -hmm. variables that go into what I tell somebody. Um, yeah. but one of the first things I do try to do is just tell people to, um, physically ground themselves, you know, mm -hmm. our body, our, our, our systems, uh, mm -hmm. our fight or flight, um, our, our hijacked, our brain is hij hijacked. We're not mm -hmm. thinking at all with our frontal cortex whatsoever. It's all the amygdala, which is our yeah. primal brain. So mm -hmm. you are just in fight or flight. How do I get safe? And one of the things I do is do your best. Try not to think about a lot of things, including trying to put the pieces together of what, what you just discovered. Because to be mm -hmm. honest with you, that drives people crazy in and of itself. Why did he do that? When did it happen? But, or she, whatever. Um, right. um, so I would get all that, whatever, and realize, you know what? You are not right now. There is not a wild, hungry tiger in your bedroom growling and staring at you. Take a deep mm -hmm. breath. Calm down. Let's do this at first. And then we can start moving forward with how we're going to heal. Yes. Very good advice. Kind of take a step back. So we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll talk more about betrayal trauma, because I think it's a, a topic that people could definitely learn more about. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to Transformation with Martinet, where we overcome everything and compromise nothing. We've been over here on the break talking about chocolate. Hmm, sounds good, doesn't it? <laughs> so anyway, we have been talking about betrayal trauma and steps that we can take and knowing that uh, if someone betrays us, it really has nothing to do with us. It's them and things that they need to work out. It doesn't mean that it's easy on us but it really has nothing to do with us. So my guest, Mr. Jay, has been talking about um, steps to take and how he would help his clients. And um, so Jay, you've given us a, a, some beginning steps, which is like to step back a bit, breathe, don't make any rash decisions. How would you go from there? Uh, well, again, uh, very good question. Uh, I'd have to probably uh, look more into the person's individual situation. Number mm -hmm. one, are they um, mentally capable enough to stay where they are? Are they safe? You know, are mm -hmm. they out of yeah. physical danger? Out of the, I, I, is there any current gaslighting? Any um, mm -hmm. uh, emotional manipulation? You know, find out that. Do you have young kids in the house? Mm -hmm. um, yada yada. One of the things I, I I have people do, and again, this is depending on where they are on the spectrum and where they mm -hmm. are on the discovery is to when they are out of hijacked brain, which is, mm -hmm. which is difficult to get out of, especially initially, 
but but I'll sit there and I'll even help work on this with them. One of the things mm -hmm. I have um, people do is, is create what's called a lifeline list. And mm -hmm. I have people, so listen, write down three people that, that you can call no matter what time it is, if you mm -hmm. need prayer. If you need prayer at 3.30 in the morning, who can you pick up the phone? Is it your pastor? Is it your mother? Is it, you know, whatever. Um, Good advice. Um, name three people that um, deliver food to your home. Uh, name three people that you can call within a moment's notice, whether it's a neighbor or a friend, whatever, can be at your house to let you leave the house and make sure you got the kids. Because there's going to be times when you need to scream at the top of your lungs or punch mm -hmm. your steering wheel, but you mm -hmm. can't leave the kids in the house. There's right. going to be times when you're in a fetal position on your bed and you can't get up to make dinner. Your kids still have to be fed. So who can I call that's going to deliver in 20 minutes, you know, for a dinner. So I have what's called a lifeline list because once you're, once you're triggered, once you have like a trigger and your mind mm -hmm. is hijacked and all you can do is being in the fetal position on your bed crying, you're, you, you can't, you're, you're not thinking, you know, with your frontal cortex mm -hmm. and all this. So you have now a visual, a list. Okay. This is the person I can call. Um, where I can do this. This is the person I can call. And it's your lifeline list because a lot of people um, are, are just not, you can't think. Your brain is hijacked, mm -hmm. especially especially in the beginning with certain triggers. Um, certainly one uh, um, uh, self-care, I mean, self-care is, is cru crucial and critical. But here's the challenge with that, Martin A, is so many people have, um, have stepped so far away from themselves, they don't even know where to begin or start with self-care. What does self-care mm -hmm. mean? Go to the beauty shop and get my hair done? Well, it can be that, but you know what? It also could mean just going in your bedroom for five minutes and saying, I don't want any disruptions. I need yeah. to breathe. I mean, self-care mm -hmm. can, you know, whatever. So um, so depending on where they are on the spectrum, depending on, you know, are they, are they not getting any sleep are, and are they drinking plenty of fluids? People discount the importance of fluids. Mm -hmm. When you're crying all day long, you're going to dehydrate yourself. You're right. going to dehydrate yourself. And if you dehydrate yourself, your organs cannot work at, at premium. Mm -hmm. um, so and if your organs aren't going to work at premium, it's going to be a tax on all your, all, everywhere else. You got to hydrate mm -hmm. yourself. But the last thing people want to do is think, oh, did I drink my eight hours, you know, eight, eight glasses of thing, you know, after they just discovered right. That's the right. last thing they want to do, you know, but you mm -hmm. got to, because you can easily dehydrate yourself, which will cascade into a bunch of negative other effects. So really it depends on, you know, where somebody is on the, on the line. And also, um, you know, as we, as we move forward, getting to know where people are and things like that, I really ask them a battery of questions, even down to what's your love language, mm -hmm. because, you know, mm -hmm. everybody's going to heal at, at, a, at a different pace and a different capacity in different mm -hmm. ways. Hypothetically speaking, if your love language is gifts, right. Mm -hmm. Um, and you found out that, um, your husband was, was, spending time on his lunch break with, with a coworker, right? And you mm -hmm. knew it was kind of blurring lines. You would not like that. You would not like that at all. You would feel betrayed. You'd have a big, huge problem. But if you mm -hmm. found out that every lunch break, he was giving her a special gift and your love language is gifts, now you're pissed because yeah. he's stealing what speaks love to you and giving it to someone else. So even mm -hmm. down to the Good love point. language. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the attachment style. What kind of attachment style does somebody have? Um, uh, where on the sibling um, totem pole are you? Are, you know, because different, uh, if you're an elder mm. sibling, you have different characteristics rather than the younger sibling. All these things yeah. will affect how and if you heal. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's, it's, it's not an easy road. It's not a short road in any capacity. And I'm sorry if people disagree with me, you never heal at all from trauma. You, you learn to live with it. You learn to live with it. Um, I always tell people that, um, so, so in a sense, you can heal, but I always tell people, think of it as like a bow and arrow. That arrow comes into your heart, okay? Mm -hmm. Initially, it de devastates it. There's blood pouring all over. It destroys it. It, 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 yeah. it It's, you know, well, eventually what happens with time and the proper help and the proper work, there's a lot mm -hmm. of work in this, which I always say, hard now, easy later. If you want it easy now, that's fine, but it's going to be hard later. So, but what happens is your heart starts to grow around that arrow because you're never going to completely take that arrow out as if it was never there. That's not going to happen. Right. It's going to be there. But what you do is you learn to build those muscles around the heart where you can put on a shirt and the stick that's, that's sticking out of your heart that rubs against that arrow is not going to budge you much because it's touching your heart because yeah. you built muscles around it. Right. Yeah, that's a very good analogy. And of course, it's like, yeah, we're never going to forget things that happen to us, but, but forgiveness, if that comes in, 
Well, but here's forgive. the part with that too, though, is that what does forgiveness mean? Because if I line up 300 people and ask them what forgiveness means, I'm going to get 300 different answers. That's true. So you have to talk, <laughs> So you have to ask them, Very what does forgiveness mean to you? And mm -hmm. let's work on that, um, on that uh, statement, point. on that example, um, mm -hmm. because that's what's going to, that's what's going to help you. You know, so many, you know, this, there's um, so many people out there want to, want to help people that are traumatized and that's great, fine mm -hmm. and dandy but I want to help the particular person's trauma, which mm -hmm. is a whole different story. Yeah, good point, good point. Because I, I know um, part of me and forgiveness, like, um, well, with the, with the physical abuse part of my life was just realizing um, my dad was doing the best he could and he just didn't know what to do half the time and I just happened to be his target. But he wasn't, he was born into a family where his dad, married his mom because he thought she couldn't have kids and then when he came along that was the biggest disappointment and he was told that he was the biggest disappointment so him having children he he didn't know what to do and he even told me this is only like maybe two weeks ago saying you know I don't know how to love he goes I did love your mother and I'm sorry I couldn't love you guys like I loved your mother um, but I was never given love. And I said, well, dad, but you were <laughs> by mom. I know that's not how you were started out, but you were given love. And I understand, I understand you now as an adult, but as a child, that was really hard. Um, but it's just, just, just try to be and express now where you are now and try to try to forgive that past as well. You know? Yeah, yeah. Do you mind if I ask uh, how how that statement made you feel? Because that that that's a statement m many people do not ever hear from their fathers. Um, it, it 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 hurts. I told him that. I said, Dad, it hurts to hear that, but I understand because of what he had himself. You know, he told me years ago how his dad didn't want him, and he's told me many many times since. He's eighty five. Um. But yeah, it, it was, uh, it, it, it was rough. And I, and, and I've just come to, you know, sometimes I, I, I have friends that uh, they've got great relationships with their dad and, and it's, it's really sweet to hear. And at the same time, it's like, oh, I wish, but then at the same time, it's like, he, he can't. And I just got to love him where he's at and he loves me how he can. And that's just the way it has to be. Yeah. You know? And sometimes we have to uh, you know, some people's love tank, their, their emotional gas tank, their love tank mm -hmm. uh, is only two gallon capacity. When ours mm -hmm. is 10 gallons, we might need right. 10 gallons from our dad and he might be mm -hmm. emptying, he might completely be emptying all of his gas into your can, but it's mm -hmm. just it, that, and he's giving his all, yeah. but it just yeah. it barely, you know, makes the meter on yours, you know. I always, right. you know, as you, I'm sure you know, it's um, if you do not heal the wounds of your past, you're going to bleed mm -hmm. on everybody. Oh um, in gosh, your I agree. And, um, and uh, you know, growing up, my father, uh, of course, that generation, corporal punishment was big. So mm -hmm. my father would use corporal punishment every time he'd, he'd hit us. He'd always say, now, come here and hug me. I love you. And I was like, mm -hmm. I don't want to hug you. You just hit Ooh. me. That's mm -hmm. but, but, but listen, here's what's interesting. When mm -hmm. I got older and he said, Jay, he said, Jay, listen, the reason I did that is because when my father hit me when I was younger, he'd say, now go in your bedroom, get away from me. You made me mad. I, I don't want you near mm -hmm. me. He said, and I never wanted my children to feel like I didn't love them, even if I was mad. So then I had to understand, whoa, he actually was, was trying to combat yeah. any notion that I had that I wasn't loved after he had to discipline me. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, going through abnormal psych as an adult or going through your genealogy and learning these things, it really helps you understand, which understanding sets the basis sometimes for forgiveness. Right, right. You know, when you, when you said that about your dad hugging you afterwards, I remember my mom, she didn't stop him. And I think she was afraid to be a parent of three and not being able to do it because she was a stay-at-home mom. And I remember her always coming in to hug me afterwards. And I was just stiff as a it's like, don't even touch me, you know? And it's interesting how my dad always said too, he goes, out of the three of you, you are the least loving. And I said, not really, but maybe it, when it comes to you and all that, maybe because I, I don't know how to express it. I can't really be me with you, you know? So 
Yeah, it's 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 just it's it's interesting how um like your dad how he coped how my dad coped it's 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 really interesting and what you bring into your own parenting after what you've been through. Yeah, parenting yeah. oftentimes is on a pendulum. You're over mm-hmm. here when you were younger, so because yeah. this happened, you want to do this to your kids. Well, then you go yeah. overboard with your kids, and then they go like so. It's like you know this pendulum. <laughs> that is that is a very good point, boy. Yeah, and I know um, your kids are very young, but um, I've apologized a lot. I have made some major mistakes and I apologize. And, and I have, you know, I, I remember getting married and thinking, well, my kids are not going to have the trauma that I did. Well, they didn't have the trauma that I did, but they had enough with the divorce, yeah. different things. I still gave them stuff that I sure as heck didn't want to. Yeah. No, and we all have, we all have. Yeah. Um, hurt people, hurt yeah. people, you know, and, and, and even though we we never want anything bad for our kids in any capacity, we're still mm-hmm. human beings where we're dealing yes. with struggles in relationships, struggles financially. We get fired from jobs. We get into our car accident and our kids often see that we're human and, mm-hmm. and we don't make the best you know decisions um, from that. I have started apologizing to my kids. As a matter of fact, the other day, and mm-hmm. I don't know if we got to go to a break, but the other day I was taking out trash with my son mm-hmm. and he lifted up the, um, the top of the trash bin and mm-hmm. I didn't realize it, but it fell and it hit the bin and I have CPTSD. So loud noises, like, you oh, know, gosh, um, mm-hmm. um, so, um, so the, I was like, what happened? What happened? And was like, you know, oh my God, who are you? What are you doing? And I wound up having to apologize to him. Mm. And I said, buddy, you know, Papa has what's called, you know, CPTSD, and this is what yeah. it is. And you know, yada yada yada. So yeah, um, I, I know at a young age, and then you spend the rest of your life trying to unlearn it or heal it. <sighs> for sure, for sure. So we're gonna take a quick break, and we'll be right back with some final thoughts. Thank you, everyone. Welcome back, everyone, to Transformation with Martinet, where my guest, Mr. J, has been talking about um, betrayal trauma and all kinds of good tips on how to get through it. And um, so (laughs) for the rest of the show, he was going to give us some of his best tips and also maybe talk just a bit about trusting your, your gut over your head or your heart. Oh, geez. Okay. Um, I'll do my best to give you some tips, but I don't know if they're the best because what one person considers a best tip, the next person will say that's common sense, but I'll do my best. Okay. Okay. (laughs) One thing I want to say is I always tell people, um, especially that say, how could I be so stupid? How could I be so Mm -hmm. stupid? Um, Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times what happens is after you discover a a, a betrayal, Mm -hmm. and again, I, I, I'm using examples from a spouse, but really you can have a betrayal from a child, a parent, right. a boss, a neighbor, um, a betrayal can be even a, even a school, uh, a church pastor, I sure. mean, or we can even have a betrayal from ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, how many times do you hear people that, you know, Hey, I exercised and I meditated and I drank all the juices and I did all that. And I like God betrayed them or what have you. So betray- mm-hmm. betrayal trauma comes in all forms and things. But mm-hmm. um, I always say, you got to be careful with in, in life in general, um, uh, to do your best to, to trust your gut, even over your heart and your mind, because, you know, your heart can um, manipulate you and your mind can play tricks on you, but your gut works on a different level. So it can't mm-hmm. lie to you. And uh, some people say, well, what's the difference between, you know, trusting your gut and trusting your ego? Um, and I always say, you know, your gut is more like a bullet point thing. Uh, Mm -hmm. it'll give you like pictures. It's, it's short, short spurts of things. Your ego gives you these long sentences and paragraphs, and it's usually more negative and stuff. So that's Mm -hmm. how oftentimes you can say, well, what, what's, what is my mind, my heart or my ego? And what is my gut? Um, and keep in mind, your Mm -hmm. gut is often completely different from what your friends are saying or what your ego is saying. Um, but going back to the, um, you know, when people say, how could I be so stupid? That's something that, you know, we call betrayal blindness. Some people call Mm -hmm. it the Red Riding Hood syndrome. You know, Red Riding Hood wanted to go see her grandmother so bad. She just wanted to see her grandmother to the point where when she walked into the, her grandmother's house, she knew she saw big teeth. Her grandmother didn't have big, sharp teeth. She saw the long nose. She saw the big eyes, but she wanted to see her grandmother so much that she decided I'm not going to turn around and run scream 
I'm still going to stay there. And what happened? Mm -hmm. She got eaten. She got ate. So yeah. um, what happens is that sometimes after we discover some type of betrayal, all of a sudden our eyes open we're like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. What I knew when A, B, and C, why didn't I react on it? Well, sometimes mm -hmm. what happens is on a whole physiological level and psychological level, oftentimes betrayal trauma, what happens is it's our mind and our body's way of actually not wanting to see the truth because we'll mm -hmm. know the profound damage and, and the, um, the, the complete change in our life that will happen if mm -hmm. we face the truth. So it's just easier to, to be in this blind state of, of, of being. That's called betrayal blindness, um, which like I said, not to beat a dead horse, how many times afterwards I say, you know what? How could I be so stupid? I saw a number in his wallet. I decided I'm not gonna question him. Why didn't I question him? How stupid can I be? Well, mm -hmm. you gotta be careful with your internal dialogue, you know, because, because you, were, you, were, you were duped, you were betrayed. Mm -hmm. You didn't act on that because you gave somebody the benefit of the doubt based on the written or unru unwritten rules of the relationship, which mm -hmm. are, you keep your stuff in your pants, you know? Mm -hmm. um, uh, other than that, and I see we got a couple more minutes. Other than that, you know, what I tell people in life, and I'm going to just kind of go back and forth uh, to, to my intrapersonal relationship coaching and my betrayal trauma tips mm -hmm. and techniques. Um, mm -hmm. This is more of an intrapersonal thing. One of the reasons I, so many people I think have um, uh, unnecessary uh, communication conflict in their life is because we expect so much from others uh, of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So how many times did you, you, do you catch yourself in the daytime when you're interacting with someone common sense says, blah, blah. well, that's not common to the other person. That's common sense to you. You know, so you can't expect you from other people. That's one of the, and, and we do, we all do that. We all do that. Um, even down to, um, if I spend the night, uh, like at a friend's house or a family's mm -hmm. house, um, I'll get up and sometimes I'll hide like a $10 bill somewhere in their book bookcase or under their mattress mm -hmm. or you know, under the bed that I'm sleeping on. And um, because I know that someday, whether it's the hour within the hour after I leave, or maybe it's 10 years down the road, they're mm -hmm. going to find that $10 and it's going to bring them some kind of joy. Well, yeah, that brings awesome. me joy. Yeah. But I don't expect people that spend the night at my house to leave me $10. So I don't, right. you know, so you can't expect others, you know, uh, you from other people. And another thing too, that I say, and this goes back to now betrayal trauma mm -hmm. is um, nobody in the history of mankind ever Ever died from a snake bite no one ever right. what people die from is when the venom gets into your bloodstream goes up to your heart and affects your heart well the same happens with pain and suffering people are going to give us pain if, if you're mm -hmm. on this earth you're going to get pain from people that's that's yeah. a given however it's your responsibility yeah. to stop the suffering and you got to stop the suffering before it gets into your bloodstream gets into your heart jades yes. you robs you of happiness turns you into mm -hmm. that grinch that monster so all the people give you pain you, you're the one that's in charge of your suffering. Absolutely. That's true. We get to choose every day. The day we're going to have, the life we're going to have. Uh, um, are we going to fulfill our purpose or are we just going to shrink down? You know, because like it, um, one of the examples I've always been given is like, you know, it's, it's, it's really quiet up here. People don't take the time to get up here to do the work to get up here. There's very few people up here. Everybody else is just kind of staying at this one spot because they're not willing to look at their past and they're not willing to find the, the blessings and the lessons. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And I'm going to tell you something, which a lot of people might disagree with me on. This is my own theory. I think mm -hmm. one of the big reasons why depression and suicide and anxiety skyrocketed during the pandemic is because it forced people to stay home and do nothing but evaluate their life. Oh, I, 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 I tend to see people didn't that like one. what they saw in the mirror. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. We were all that's forced a good to look call. at ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Even the, even us in the world of personal development, even being around our spouses, our kids being around and everything, boy, that was some challenge. <laughs> that oh, yeah. was, yeah, I'm used to my husband going to work and when he was here, oh, it yeah. wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. Hey, have you gotten yet from your kids? Don't life coach me. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I get that now from my 10 year old. Holy oh, Lord. man, I, I, I will often um, I, I know that you're not going to listen to me like this. However, I've got a colleague. You can talk to my friend, Mr. J, because it's going to be in a different coming from a different source, not just mom or dad. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. I know. I'm not sure how much time we 
Yeah, but I will quickly say, like speaking minute. of my son, yep. you know, I, I've been telling him, go ahead. I feel we just have one minute. minute. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> I've been telling my son for a long time about, you know, how he's in, he's, he's pre-puberty and, mm-hmm. and, and all the changes that are going to happen. And I've been telling him, you know, about, you, you know, you're going to start getting hair in your body and your voice mm-hmm. is going to drop. And I've been telling him for so long, but what I didn't tell him, and I feel so bad was all of the emotional and psychological changes mm. that, you know, your amygdala is growing at a double the rate of your frontal cortex. So if you get, all of a sudden you get upset, don't think you're a bad person. It's because part of your brain is growing at double the speed and rapid rate of, of, yeah. of your, you know, um, logical brain. Um, so I, I think that's one thing we don't really get into when it comes to, to talking to kids about puberty and something we should. I, I agree with you hundred percent. So um, we've got just uh, just a few yeah. seconds left. Where can everybody find you? Oh, everybody can find me on uh, my website, mrjrelationshipcoach.com. Simple as that. I got all kinds of free YouTube clips, free resources. Um, you can find all my handles there, mrjrelationshipcoach.com. Thank you, Marnie. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been an awesome conversation. I know we can keep going. Um, Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us. And we will see you back here next week, 1 p.m. Eastern every Friday. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Transformation with Martinet. Did listening today spark a sense of hope and possibility? Hold on to this feeling and tune in every second and fourth Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific for more inspiring conversations with Martinet and her guests. They will show you there is hope and you are right where you need to be. Martinet is dedicated to supporting you right where you are while launching you towards promise, passion, and possibility that leads to the fulfilled life your heart aches for. If you're tired of being stuck, schedule a complimentary consultation with Martinet and get on the exciting path towards the life you want to be living. Visit martinetemmons.com and make your appointment today.